Hi, this is Phil Spencer, and you're listening to the Inner Circle Podcast. For the fans, by the fans. Welcome to the Inner Circle Podcast, the premium podcast for Xbox One. You are now rocking with your boy, K-O-R-X Kal-L, and I'm here with my man, B Money 101. What's up, everybody? How's everybody doing out there? Yeah. So, obviously, um, from here on, you're going to hear a new voice on the show. Um, he's been on the show before, but he will be replacing a vet uh, that was an original member to the team, um, our old partner, Unify, who stepped down recently uh to do other things <clears throat> and we really appreciate him you know he'll be missed and things like that but you know take is going to move forward takes going to continue to grow and uh skittles who you some of you guys know from twitch and some of you guys know from some of our reviews back in the day uh will be replacing him uh skittles is a great guy flows really well knows a lot about games and you'll be seeing a lot more of him not just on um, Twitch, but actually on our channel, uh, he's interviewed Craig Duncan. Uh, he's got a few interviews that we'll be releasing shortly. You guys will be able to check that out and some of the things that we had at E3. So, you know, give him a big warm welcome. Uh, when we drop the next episode, he'll be on. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it tonight. Uh, but definitely make sure you guys give him a shout and welcome him to the Inner Circle Podcast team. So we're going to focus on E3 and a few other things, um, as well as Gamescom, talk about some things here and there, and talk about some offbeat things that happened to us while we were there, which was really crazy. But um, first of all, you know, I want to say that E3 was an amazing experience. It really was. We're really grateful to the Xbox team. You guys have heard me say this before. Um, we all met up for the first time in LA, which was a great experience. And we had so much fun. We really gelled. You can tell that we already had chemistry. So, uh, you know, it wasn't like, hey, I'm meeting this guy for the first time. It was like, hey, I see you in person. What's up? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was That's, nice, man. Yeah, it was cool. So it was it was really cool. It wasn't like we didn't know who we who each other were. So that was that was pretty dope. Um, obviously, we we went to the Microsoft conference and it was a great great conference. Uh, we met some people there from Hip Hop Gamer to Gamer Tag Radio. Uh, we we we've seen Phil Spencer. We met Kudo. We've seen um, Larry Herb. We met the son of Ford. Um, I forget what it was his uh, grandfather's name, but we met the current CEO of Ford Motors. So that was really cool in itself, uh, as well as Bonnie Ross. And we chatted with um, Kiki Wolfkill. There was a lot of people in the Microsoft uh, development community, first party studios that we met that was really, really awesome that we got a chance to chat with and may possibly have on future shows. So the brightest, the, the future's bright for tech and the future's bright for the Xbox platform. So let's jump right in. Um, you know, the first game that they showed at the event was Halo 5. Halo 5, to me, looked great. It was it looked amazing. We all know what Halo 4 looked like. Halo 4 was probably, and arguably, between that and Gears 3, arguably the best-looking game on the Xbox One platform. I mean, the lighting was amazing. The, the effects was amazing. It just looked really, really good. Halo 5 one-ups it but it doesn't one up in a in a way where it's like man you could tell that's next gen <laughs> like you know like it's almost like it looked great but it didn't blow me away brandon what is your thoughts on that yeah man i definitely have to agree the, the game looks great um you know it's not face melting or, or mind blowing or anything like that um i think what they're really going for is just that the next gen experience right um you, you can definitely see that with the war zone mode that they introduced uh right. so i mean we'll, we'll get some next gen experiences and hopefully the next halo is something that'll really uh, melt faces it's the one thing i like about microsoft and what they're doing you know people don't want to recognize it but the one thing microsoft is doing is you know anybody can can cut away pieces of a game and put all this power into graphics and you know make things look beautiful and stunning but then you have a you know six six hour five hour game maybe less than that. And then, you know, the game looks amazing, but where's the substance? Halo has to bring substance. Literally, 343 cannot mess up Halo 5. No, nah, they can't mess they, this one up. They cannot mess this up. This is almost like the last shot 
really to a lot of Halo fans to make Halo as relevant and as big as it was on the 360 when Bungie had it. And I'll be honest with you, I think Bungie did a solid job, but I actually like what 343 does with the story more than what Bungie does with the story. Um, I just feel like they go so much in depth into the Halo universe that it just really is not about just Master Chief trying to stop the Covenant from opening Halo rings. Like they're really going deep into the universe, and I like the approach that they did with the, the little, you know, MP3 files and the, the video, you know, the, the show that they had with Locke, which was really cool. Um, obviously, this is a more tactical Halo. You're going to be playing in teams. This is the first time any Halo has done that. So it's a big, big, big difference between any Halo we've ever played. Yes, it's still a first-person shooter. Yes, you're still the main star between Locke and Master Chief, but you have squad mates now. And I don't mean, you know, like humans. I mean AI squad mates. And the humans can pick up any one of those other characters if you want to play co-op. It's not like the old ones where it was two chiefs, you know, no, you're actually going to be a character that's already in the game. So that's kind of cool. That's different. And I look forward to that. You think that's a, a cool difference, B? Yeah, I, I definitely uh, like the change up. You know, I, I've come from squad based shooters, Rainbow Six, Ghost Recon, things like that. So um, to change it up a little bit, it kind of opens it up to, to, you know, tactical guys like me. So. Right. Um, you know, it brings us into the fold and, you know, I'm good with that. Right. Yeah, definitely looking forward to that, seeing how that plays out. And I think Halo 5 is going to be a big, big, big title this year for the Xbox One platform because everybody loves Halo. Um, people want to say, hey, they, they rehashed the, the same games that had Halo last year. Dude, that was a collection of games. <laughs> it was a collection of games. It really wasn't like Halo. You know, we've all played those games before. We really appreciate what they did, but Halo 5 is really Halo, the next Halo. So looking forward to that. Um, obviously, Microsoft then went on. Um, they spoke at length about the backwards compatibility, which, you know, people want to try to downplay. People really want to try to downplay backwards compatibility. And the thing that I think people fail to realize is that it's not really so much about the backwards compatibility thing. It's about ownership of your own titles. That's what people are missing. You know, it's one thing where it's like, okay, you have a game and you can play this old game. Nobody's not looking to play something from 2005 or 2006. If some people want to do that, sure. But what about all the money you spent on all these digital titles, all these indie games, all the free games you got with gold? What about those titles? You're supposed to own those. So I'm just supposed to give that up. I'm just supposed to let that go away. And if Microsoft, which they are actually doing, surprisingly, if you look at some of the games they're bringing over, it's really the biggest hits. It's really the biggest titles that are coming. Red Dead Redemption is the number one game. So, you know, bringing these games over, if you own them digitally, you just increased your library. It doesn't matter that it's old. You own it. That's what's most important. That's what people are missing. And you just increase your library tenfold. Yeah, I definitely have to agree. I think that's the one thing that people are kind of overlooking is that, you know, if you own these these games digitally, you know, you just increase your library. They, they automatically download uh, to your system. All you have to do is bring them from the cloud and, and add them to your library. Um, you know, for me, th this is huge. You know, I, I've, as I mentioned before, I was a big indie guy, big arcade guy um, on 360. I have maybe 150 games wow. that are just stored on my console that, you know, you know, they're not disc based games. I, I couldn't take them anywhere, so I had to keep the 360 to keep those games. Right. Um, and and if a good majority of those games, or if, even if all of those games can come over to the Xbox One, um, you know, I, I wouldn't get rid of my 360, but I can at least put that in the closet, you know, and I can game on all my games on one system. Right. And, you know, that's, that's something that a lot of people don't look at. I mean, you can look at what the other companies are doing, you know, Nintendo and, and, and Sony, and if you want to play your old games, you have to pay for them. Microsoft took it, you know, one step beyond that. And gamers definitely have to appreciate that. And I think that's the one thing they're missing. Everybody wants to say that it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Sure, that's fine. You know, maybe maybe four, four, four or five years from now, we forget all about backwards compatibility and we don't even play, you know, Halo, you know, 4 or we don't play Gears 2 or whatever the games are that come over, right? We don't play Red Dead Redemption. The point of the matter is you own it. You can play it whenever you want. You don't have to rent it. You don't have to pay for it if you own it already. And all the DLC comes with it. That's insane. 
you get all the DLC with it if you own the DLC. That's just crazy. It just comes right over. That's bananas. And it's just so overlooked. I'm not saying that it's something that is a game changer. That's not what I'm saying. However, the appeal is if you have a 360 and, and people want to say it's just a gimmick. It's what something Microsoft did for marketing reasons to get people to get from the 360 to the Xbox One. And what's wrong with that? What is wrong with that? Nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. If I, if I know I have a, a large install base, but they don't want to leave my old the old console that we produce because they have so much content on there, why wouldn't I say, hey, guess what? Bring that content to the new console, plus play all the new titles with all the new features that we have on the new console. That's not an incentive? Why wouldn't they do that? People who try to downplay that are just not looking at the bigger picture because they want to downplay it because it's a strength. It's a strength. And you want to try to make the console look as weak as possible compared to the competition. But that's one strength where really none of the other two, you know, companies are like, they're kind of upset. <laughs> they, yeah. might, they might be a little bit upset that Microsoft pulled this stunt. And um, I'm, I'm, it's something that, yeah, it works in Microsoft's favor. So that was... Yeah, that was I a, really don't think people understand the impact of how big this is, especially if Microsoft... Um, you know, they they said that by the end of the year, there'll be 100 games um, digitally that you can play from the 360. And, right. you know, that li library would continue to increase. Right. You, you have gamers who only play three games a year. And, you know, let's just say they enjoyed the first Forza Horizon game. Mm -hmm. They enjoyed it so much that that's the only game that they play. Or let's say they enjoy <laughs> Ghost Recon or Black Ops 2. Or, you know, any game like that. And you can only play those games on 360. Right. And maybe they look at Xbox One and they say, oh, well, maybe there's only one or two games I would play. I, I don't see why I would make that investment yet. Right. If you can bring those core titles, like Red Dead Redemption is the number one game that's on there. You know, you know why that is? Because, first of all, the game was not available on PC. And it was one of Rockstar's biggest games. You bring that game over, there's still a, a huge community playing that game on 360. You bring that game over, people have reason to now say, I can put this 360 away. Right. Right. So, I mean, th there's there's a large impact. People don't understand how big it is. And it might not be the, that big for many gamers, but it will bring people over to the, to the new console. I think it will. I said that before. I said all oh, Microsoft ever had to do, in my opinion, to move people from 360 to Xbox One. Um, you know, having them drop, you know, 100 games by holiday season is crazy. But just thinking about the potential they have for all the titles that they can bring over that won't ever get a remaster. You right. Know, it's just it's it's so it's so overlooked and it's such a strength. I, trust me, Microsoft is going to have a bananas. A bananas holiday season. I already know it and heard people say that's all I ever wanted, and now they're right. crossing over. So that's pretty dope. That's pretty dope. Um, you know, they showed Gears of War, um, the Ultimate Collection, and we speculated on this for a while. A lot of people speculated on it. Will it be all three games? Some people said yeah, but no, it's just the first game, and it looks it looks good. It looks clean when you're playing the game. It's smooth. I mean, you can feel the difference between 30 frames and 60 frames because Gears in itself is a bulky game. Yes, it is. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's yeah. a bulky game. The characters are huge. You 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 wall bounce. Um, you hit A to stick to cover. So it's a very bulky, clunky game in itself, but it was actually, it worked. It, it really worked for what it does. And the 60 frames per second really just took it up a notch. So it, it's a really good game. I look forward to playing it. Um, I heard that they added some new content from the PC version, so that yep. may be worth picking up. Um, I didn't play the PC version, so I definitely want to pick it up. Um, but they are also talking about bringing Gears 2 and 3 through uh, BC, which is, yeah. once again, a plus to the Xbox platform. I just think it's, it's really dope. What is your thoughts on that, B? You know, I'm, I'm a huge gearhead. You know, that's that's my Microsoft game of choice, um, you know, from the first party standpoint. Um, I, th I think it was, it's, it's huge to add 60 frames to that game. And, you know, when they were talking about this, I, I kind of called, you know, that they would probably only do the one game. Uh, that was that was the best way to go. I, I think that was a safe route, you know, totally 
revamp the, the original game. Um, if you've got a chance to play it, they kind of retooled some of the maps a little bit. So they're not the exact same map from the original game, right. uh, which is nice. Um, and, you know, the possibility of, you know, let's just say when it releases, hey, you know, Gears 2, Gears 3, you get this free, you know, if, right. you, if you buy the Ultimate Edition right? through backwards compatibility. So, I mean, you, you can't really go wrong there. Gears, in my opinion, was was the best game out of out of the four games that came out. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I felt like they did the right thing. Gotcha. Yeah, no, they. I, I think they did too, and I, I look forward to playing the game and, and getting back in the groove of Gears again. And I think it's dope because you got you got Gears Four coming out, and just right. like last year, you you know they gave us Halo. It's to get you back into the feel of those games. It's to get you back into the groove of those games. So when those games come out the familiarity is there. And I think that's really smart on their part. Um, you know, not too much after that, uh, you know, they had showed Gears 4. Now, a lot of people said that Gears 4 didn't look that different from Gears 3. I want you to go back and look at Gears 3, <laughs> okay? Gears 3 looked amazing. It really did. But I want you to go back and look at Gears 3. Then I want you to go look at a trailer of Gears 4 that's on the Xbox platform right now and run it on your television. Just run it on your television and watch the opening scene as they start to come out of the woods. Look at the water. Look at the ground. Look at the foliage. It is stunning. It You can see it is an Unreal Engine 4. You can see it. And that wasn't like, you know, some crazy you know cgi no that was actually in-game footage because as soon as they stop talking they go right into the gameplay and you're moving the guy and you can still see the same thing you can see the environment looks great the sky looks amazing that storm and the lightning was crazy it the game looks really good um and it's definitely going to be one of the best looking games on the console when it comes out and the craziest thing about it is that it's a year away it's a year away and it already looks that good B, I mean, I'm stunned, honestly, by the way that, it looks. That is the power of Unreal. <laughs> when, when I try to tell people how dope Unreal is about to get, Gears is just scratching the surface. Unreal is going to be something serious this generation. It really they, is. They drop updates for Unreal very frequently. If, if you download the Unreal Engine, you know, you can play around with it, see what you can make out of it. But the updates that they drop for Unreal are ridiculous. And then the games that we get from Unreal are going to be something serious. Yeah. Gears, the Gears 4 trailer looked amazing. Mm. I was a little heartbroken. We didn't see Marcus. You know, <laughs> I wanted to see Cold Train, you know, mm-hmm. give me some of my OG, you know, Gears veterans. But, you know, the trailer looked amazing. Um, I, I want to see what's going on. You know, it was a mysterious trailer. It seems like they're looking for somebody. Hopefully it's Marcus. Um but you know, I'm a, I'm excited, man. I'm a gearhead all day, so um, I was just, I was just glad to see it. I'm looking forward to this game because they it's you know you look at the original Gears series story wise. To me, it was just like you know a a blockbuster movie. You know, right. it was just it was just a blockbuster action movie. It was a lot of explosion, a lot of action, a lot of you know awesome sequences of gameplay, but the story substance wasn't there. And in this one, in the new series, the one thing that they decided to do was to go for substance now. You know, Microsoft is taking this initiative, this generation, to focus heavy, heavy, heavy on story. You look at what they're doing with Halo. You look at a game like Ori. You know, you look at some of the titles that they've put out already, and you have to say that they are really starting to focus on this this story dynamic um, to really pull people in depth so that way... You recognize, hey, not only are you getting a quality action title, you're also getting a quality story behind what's going on. It's the one thing that kind of left me with with Gears, like, I still don't know where these locusts came from. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Like, I understand it's a different world, but why is the queen still like a human being? Like, why is she so close to looking human? Why is she the only one that speaks proper English? You know, why are they underground? You know, why was the father kidnapped? There's just so many things that truly truly were wasn't answered in the game i mean there's obviously some type of experimentation you could tell because marcus fathers is a scientist and we know kind of why the war started with the emulsion and 
you have these things happening with the cog and the, and the pendulum wars. It's a lot of things that happen, but a lot of that stuff is open ended. You know, right. there's no there's no closings to those things. There's no real depth of story between behind those things. So I'm really looking forward to seeing where they take this and how all of this intertwines and connects. So it should be really interesting. Um, obviously we're big rare fans over here. I, yes, indeed. You yes, know, indeed. I, Super Nintendo was my console, man. Everybody liked Genesis and Sonic was cool, but Super Nintendo was my console. And Donkey Kong and Star Fox were like classics they were i was i loved them especially donkey kong i mean everything about donkey kong was amazing and rare eventually you know after they left nintendo with the wii u situation and brought cameo over from the wii u to the xbox uh platform uh xbox 360 platform actually um you know they also brought some of their creativity and, and some of those games were overlooked you know, I'll be honest with you. Some of those games were overlooked. A lot of people overlooked Grab by the Ghoulies. A lot of people overlooked, you know, Blinks the Time Sweeper. They just Jeff was, Force Gemini. Jeff Force Gemini. There was a lot of games that were overlooked on, uh, you know, uh, off of Rare's titles. And when you look at what they're offering, I never had a 64. Never. But you don't need to tell me I get to play Blast Corps. I get to play Jeff Force Gemini. On my Xbox One, the original Banjo? Oh, my God. Oh, my gosh. And what's crazy about that is that, you know, I never played a Banjo. Any Banjo. So I get to play the original. I get to play the second one. And I get to play Nuts and Balls. I know everybody says stay away from Nuts and Balls, but I still got to try it for myself just to see what it's like. So I'm very happy that they're coming out with this rare replay. And I think what they're trying to do, and this is not my, my opinion. I haven't heard this from anybody at Rare. But what I think they're trying to do is get people to remember the IPs they own. Think about that. 30 games that they're releasing on Rare Replay. $30. Ooh, $30. That's a dollar a game. And you get to see this vast library of titles that Rare has worked on that they can revive and make it to a full-blown game at any minute on the Xbox platform. At any minute, they can do that. And that is just an awesome, awesome thing to know. And for those of you who grew up in the 80s and those of you who grew up in the 90s that have played those rare titles, like Snake Rat on the Roll on the, on the NES, which I love, by the way, you know, from N64 to Super Nintendo, some of the games that they came out with, those games are available on Rare Replay. And you can have that nostalgic factor. And for those of us who didn't play those games, you'll be able to get a chance to understand what made Rare so special. I think that's that's just amazing. I think that's just really amazing. What are your thoughts? I, I thought this was the the perfect way to, to set off Rare's comeback. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've talked about Rare so much on our podcast. And, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Rare. And I was talking about, you know, them sprinkling all the characters and all these games. And then they hit us with this. Right. You know, everybody in one package. You, you can't go wrong with that. You get, you know, games from 64. You get games from NES. You get games from 360. You know, you, you get games from every generation of a console all in one package. You, you can't ask for much more than that. 30 games for $30 is probably one of the best values um, that's ever been in, in gaming. Yeah. You, you get full. These are full games. You're, you're getting a full Battletoads game for one dollar. You know, full <laughs> game for one dollar. Where where else are you going to get that? Yeah. You you go to an arcade and put a dollar in a in a Battletoads game. How long are you gonna play it? Five minutes. You you ain't getting nowhere with, with a dollar in an arcade. Right. You're getting a full game for one dollar. You, you can't go wrong with that. This is the perfect move uh, for Microsoft, Phil Spencer, and Rare. You know, showcase what what Rare has done, and then hit us with a sea of, of, of what Rare's future is going to be. I love the new logo. It's reminiscent of the old logo, mm -hmm. the new logo with the blue and gold. Mm -hmm. You know, Rare's, Rare's on the comeback, and I, I like what I'm seeing, man. I, I like it because it's not, there's no remaster factor behind it. You know, right. I've, I've been adamant about remasters, and, and, and the fact that I'm sure they've worked on some of these games. I'm sure I'm sure that they touch maybe if there's a bug or a glitch. But then again, I think some of those things are just kept in their original state. But the fact that you're getting all these games on one disc, to me, is just crazy. You know, 
a company like Nintendo would have charged you $9.99 to play the original <laughs> Banjo 64. You know what I'm saying? Like, they would have charged you for that. Yeah. You know, and it's not to disrespect the Nintendo, but that's what they do. You know, that's what they would have done. They would have figured out a way to make money off of that. And Microsoft is like, hey, look, man, just look. We know what you guys wanted from Rare. We know where Rare was at. We know what they've been doing. Here, you know, here's a good gesture to show you, you know, some of the creative things they that they've done. And, you know, they these IPs are still under the house because the IPs that they don't own aren't in there. So these IPs are still under the house. And not to mention, who knows what other IPs that they may have? Who yeah. knows? They only put 30 games in there. And that's just 30 games for 30 years. Nobody said that was all their games. You know, who's to say they don't come out with a rare replay number two? Who knows if this one's successful? I can tell you this. When that thing hit, that thing went on. That thing <laughs> The percentage it went up on reserves was <laughs> sky high. It was like plus a thousand percent on Amazon. That thing oh, yeah. skyrocketed on reserves. People went crazy for it. That's how much people want to see Rare make their comeback. That's, That's how right, bad man. people want to see Rare make their comeback. And you can say whatever you want about, oh, all the talent is left. No. David Mills is still there. One of the brothers is still there. And that's important. That is highly important because it 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 keeps some of the originality intact, you know, and it and it keeps some of the the essence of what Rare was still intact. So you can see it in their new announced game, Sea of Thieves. And I, I just think that this game that they showed is going to be very, very special. Now we spoke with Craig about this game and he wants us to look for all these Easter eggs and things like that and, you know, try to figure these things out on our own. But, you know, obviously, I kind of already know what the game is and where it's going. What do do you think, B? What do you think? Well, it's definitely going to be a massive multiplayer game. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you're definitely going to have, you know, have a squad or, you know, a guild that you you put together and and head out to to sea. Uh, You may be treasure hunting. Um, You may be looking at takeover you know, other, other ships and, and recruit them to be, be in your guild. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of possibilities there. Um, but, but I'm excited, man. You know, the, the trader left a, a little bit of mysterious, um, tone to it. So we don't know the exact details of it, but master multiplayer is definitely high on the list. And I think that's what it's going to be. What's crazy is that he said, if you go back and you look at our interview with Skittles and Craig Duncan, he says, every, character that moved in that game was a person was a person so it's either a massive co-op game or an mmo the the thing that gives me the idea that's the mmo is the fact that there were other ships that had a whole other crew in the game that you battle if you watch the trailer now that could also be pvp we don't know i think it's an mmo most people think it's an mmo um but you can tell that there's something mysterious about the game. You can tell that Rare is getting back to form. You're, you're able to create your own pirate. You know, try, probably, if you think about it in an Assassin's Creed Black Flag way, let's say you get a ship, and as you open up this giant map, you travel maybe from island to island, and you can discover treasures on the island. You don't know who's on the island. It could be a whole nother crew on that island, you know, or you could run into a ship that may be small and they're just starting out. Or your ship is overly powerful. Maybe you blow them out the water and steal their loot. Like those are the possibilities of things that can happen. This is a very, very ambitious title. I can tell you that much. It's a big title. It's triple A without question. And them making it go Xbox one and PC exclusive just, just makes this game a huge, huge, huge title. Because you are including the PC fan base now on crossplay with Xbox One. And we're going to be starting to see a lot of those things. So I'm looking forward to the game. I think it's going to be a special title. And I think Rare is coming back to real form. Well, that's very interesting. Um, you know, obviously, we we saw Dan Greenwalt there. We spoke with him a little bit about Forza 6. Um, and, you know, we've had a few racers released after Forza 5. Now, 
a lot of us felt that Forza 5 at the time was kind of like that benchmark. It was 1080p, 60 frames per second. We know about the downgrades to it. Um, it didn't look like how it was presented when it first came out, and they cut out some of the animated people on the sidelines for cardboard cutouts. And we get that. We get that. Um, you know, but it's a, it's a launch title. It's a launch title. Um, obviously, they've had two years to mess around with the tech, two years to mess around with the Xbox One, and they've created a new engine. A lot of people felt that Forza 6 was going to be a DX12 title. It's not. It's a DX11 game um, on a, a modified DX11 engine. The game still looks amazing. It still runs at 1080. It's still 60 frames per second. It still has 24 cars. Uh, it still comes starts with, four, what is it, 450 cars to start? 450 cars. 450 cars to start. And you have 24 maps. That is crazy. That's just at launch. That's at launch. Plus, they're giving away um, some free content as well with the game, which is going to be really interesting as well. So for all that to happen and the game still look good and still have, um, you know, night racing and um, weather weather and things like that, you know, it's, it's going to be real special. A lot of people are upset because I think that is not dynamic weather or dynamic night. Um, I think you have to turn those things on or you set up the race how you want to set it up or maybe as you go from race to race these things are set up for you either way the, the point being is is that you have these features in the game you're hitting 80 pieces for a second I'm sure there had to be a sacrifice somewhere <laughs> there had to be a sacrifice somewhere um, whether it's the number of cars which they didn't because they added 24 they tried to give you as much as they could in this one title um but try to make it non-noticeable and whatever sacrifices they made. I think, in my opinion, I think that's what happened. So I'm really impressed with what they did. Um, some fans might not. Some fans might gloss over it. They want to compare it to Project Cars or, um, you know, Drive Club, whatever. You know, the bottom line is, is that there's no game on console right now that's kind of doing what they're doing overall with, I guess you could say, what comes with the game. I guess you could say in, in that regard, like what comes with the game. So that's definitely a different dynamic. I'm really impressed with it. What is your thoughts, B? Well, I'm, I'm just glad that, um, you know, the game looks as good as it does and it's mm -hmm. still running uh, DX11. Right. I'm a big fan of just traditional racers. You know, I, I enjoy my Forza Horizon uh, too, but I, I just want to get on the track, you know, see who's the best man behind the wheel. So, right, right. you know, Forza 6 is right up my alley. I definitely like the customization and, and the tuning and stuff like that of, of Forza games. And it looks like they step, stepped it up a little bit as well. So, um, you know, you, you'll be able to look at the every aspect of the car and, and be able to customize that. So uh, that that's pretty huge, especially guys who like to uh, upload their uh, custom decals and stuff like that. Right. You know that's that's huge for that community um so i'm really excited for the game i, I like what they're doing I, I like the weather effects that they added uh the night night driving is, is huge um i definitely want to see you know some type of, of street race or something uh, along those lines DLC come down the line right uh, in the future but the game looks great and you know i'm pretty excited for this fall now i heard a rumor recently that phil said that they're coming out with another forza iteration i don't know what it is it could be Forza Rally. Um, you know, it could be Forza Street. Now, I would love a Forza Street. I would if love If you can like give that. me a Forza Street game, I'm in there like swimwear. I'm in there like swimwear. For because real. <laughs> Need for Speed Underground is probably one of my favorite Need for Speeds, and I don't really like arcade racers. Right. But if you can give me a Need for Speed feel with a uh, a Forza, you know, driving mechanics, I'm in there. That's that's what I want. That would be crazy. I, I love Forza Horizon. And, um, you know, I, I like Forza. Don't get me wrong. I like Forza. But I'm more of an arcade type guy. So I love Forza Horizon. I love drifting. But the one thing I wish they had that made it really arcadey, some of the, the best things about Underground is Nitrous. You know, yeah. getting that boost and just seeing your speedometer hit 200-something miles per hour as you're flying past cars trying not to crash on a straightaway. It's just exhilarating. So yeah. imagine if Forza stepped up and did that. You know, they give you the, all the tuning that you ever wanted. You know, put rims on a car. 
decals, neon lights, design the interior, you know, crazy engines, NOS, turbo, like all the stuff you would do in underground, but in a Forza style and more tuning that you would do in regular Forza, but you can yeah. add it to the street. And then you give me cities like New York, Tokyo, LA, you give me some awesome soundtracks, you know, kind of like how they did with Forza Horizon, Horizon. indie scenes, yeah. right? But they give me, you know, custom hip hop or, you know, some of some of the, the alternative music or maybe some rock and you can mix it up almost Project Gotham like that yeah. would that oh would be God. crazy. <laughs> that would crush. That would crush. That would sell. That would that, sell. That would be that would bring the guys who are arcade, you know, racers, guys who are fans of mm-hmm. Need for Speed and games like that. That would bring them into the Forza mode and right. that would get get the you know, get them to get into Forza. Whereas, you know, something the traditional game or horizon might not fit what they're looking for, but a street game can definitely cater to another audience, you know, for Forza. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it, it was, it was a great, great showing um, of what they did for Forza. And um, I look forward to seeing what they, um, I look forward to seeing it drop at the end of the year. Cause I'm definitely going to pick it up because it's something different and I need to get myself into racing titles again, like I did when I was younger. So, you know, some of the big, big, big things that they showed obviously was ReCore. A lot of people glossed over ReCore because they didn't show gameplay. It was only a CGI trailer. And I'll admit the CGI trailer wasn't exciting, but I don't think it was meant to get you exciting. I think it was meant to show you some type of an emotional level of this, you know, robotic dog sacrificing itself. Then give you the mystery of her taking the orb and putting it in a different machine and then, you know, finishing up with the shadowy outline of her and all these robots that she has with her. And, um, you know, it's it's a mysterious game. Some information came out about it, which is really, really cool from what I understand. But the fact that they have, you know, Kenji Ifune on it and um, the Metroid Prime crew building this title... This is a huge game. You don't just go out and get this type of this type of talent, this type of experience for it not to be a major title for the Xbox One. And it is. It's a big AAA title. Um, all, of, all of this takes place in some type of, you know, apocalyptic desert area. And, um, you know, it is, I don't know how the game is going to be played, but I know the game is story driven. I know that. And it's very interesting. And I'll give you my take and my ideas on it. But what do you think, B? What do you think this game is going to be about and, and how how you think it would play out based on the trailer? Let me first start off by saying that Record was probably my game of the show. Um, it's the game that probably had me most intrigued uh, from the Microsoft conference. Um, I, I did a little bit of reading up on um, some of the background of the game. Uh, it looks like you're going to play... The main character's name is Jewel, okay. and uh, you know the the core is basically her companion um, throughout the game. Mm-hmm. And you know the yellow robots are you know sub companions. So you insert the core into the yellow robot, and they will you know help you throughout the game. Um, and as you kind of see in the trailer, it looks like it's going to be a robot field game. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not that many humans left in this area. Uh, of the world where the where the game is set up so um it looks like we're going to have a mass villain who is probably creating all these robots mm. and you know trying to take over and and jewel is out there trying to stop them so you know i'm pretty excited about the game i, I think it's going to be a story driven game right. i think this is definitely something that microsoft needed where it's you know it's not a big you know g style game but It'll definitely bring fans into, you know, something that's a little smaller, but can give you that same experience as like a Tomb Raider or something like that. Right. Um, and this is something that Microsoft owns. So this is something where, you know, they can build upon this in the future. Whereas, you know, a game like Tomb Raider or something that they don't own, they don't have direct rights over that. So, right. you know, they have no control. But um, it looks like it's late to release in 2016, I would have definitely loved to see some gameplay on that game since it, it is releasing, but there's always hope for Gamescom and, you know, 
there's there's other events happening throughout the year, so I'm sure we'll be seeing this game. Yeah, I think we'll see it at games time for sure. Um, at least at least a small gameplay snippet of it. Um, one of the things that I read that uh, you know Inafune said was that when you are in the game, you know you have this dynamic sandstorm that happens through the course of the game, and you may be on a particular path, and then suddenly this sandstorm would come. You would have to find cover and, and ride out the sandstorm. And, and once the sandstorm finishes, the entire environment changes. So the path that you were on no longer exists. It's gone. And you have to find a new path to get to whatever your location is. I think that is one of the craziest boomerangs you can throw in a game. That is, that's a crazy boomerang. Being in one particular area and then having the the whole you know environment or the whole area change on you during the course of the game while all this is happening is crazy. Now, obviously, like you said before, you know I just heard a rumor that you know PS4 will get Tomb Raider, okay, yep. and it's supposed to be coming out in the fourth quarter of 2016. So at the you know Microsoft will have full exclusivity for an entire year. Which to right. me is that's enough incentive for anybody who wants to buy the Xbox One <laughs> to play Tomb Raider to buy it. That is plenty of time, you know. No, don't get me wrong. There's some guys that would just say, "Hey, I'll just wait. It's not that big a deal." Um, it's the same thing I, you know, same way I am with Shimu. Um, but at the same time, you have Tomb Raider that's going to be exclusive to the Xbox One for a year. Um, it'll probably hit PC first and then eventually hit uh, PlayStation Four. So now that we know that that is going to PlayStation 4, or shall I say, now that we know that there's a rumor out there that it is going to PlayStation 4, um, we can kind of put that to rest and move on from that. But like you said, that is a game that will probably be lost eventually, and they don't have a a character like that. Having Jewel as this uh, exploratory character in a futuristic setting, in my opinion, is big. It's big. It is big. And I think picking a female character, which is one of the few characters Microsoft does not have representation in, in their first party titles. You yep, have that's huge. you have all the machismo of Master Chief, all the machismo of Marcus Phoenix, and you have the Fable characters as well. In the Fable series, usually you can pick whether male or female, but most of the time they always advertise the game with a male character. Um, you know, you look at some of the other titles that they have, Crackdown is male driven, um, you, you know, Midas Cameo and a few others like um, Jonah Dark. There's not a lot of female representation on the Xbox One. So finally coming out with a triple A title with a female character is huge. And to have this game possibly be their own first per uh, not first person, excuse me, um, single player adventure, which is what Microsoft is missing. That's one of the things Microsoft is missing. That single player, you know, one player experience where they're so focused on online and multiplayer driven titles, that one player experience, that one person experience, story driven title with a venture behind it is going to be huge for the platform, in my opinion. And you already have a great directly behind it and a great team building it. I'm just thinking about all the possibilities they could do with this game, the future of this title, and how it all plays out. And you know that core is going to have to, a lot to do with puzzles. I can say right now, yes. this game is going to have a ton of puzzles. You're talking about Tomb Raider, and you look at Uncharted, this is what this probably will be for the Xbox One. That's probably what yeah. it will be for the Xbox One. It's going to be huge, man. It's going to be Some, huge. Something that they can finally control. Um, they have something under the wing. Um and you mentioned it before about them, you know, being more story driven. Mm-hmm. I think they they kind of learned, um, you know, a little bit from from last generation. Um, you know, their competitor had some very strong story driven games. Right. And you know, Xbox Live has been boasted, you know, for, for the the online experience. So I think Phil kind of recognized that and is definitely trying to implement that while still giving us that that crazy multiplayer experience that we've come to love so yeah you know i think it's a great direction man yeah i agree um obviously we've we've been talking about microsoft and the whole pc thing and making one ecosystem i've been adamant about not putting exclusives on a platform but there's some things that i've had to learn obviously um and and you know again i for me i'm all about consoles i'm a console gamer i'm not a pc gamer 
I'm not a PC gamer. I'm just going to be honest. I'm not a PC gamer. It's no disrespect to the PC platform. The PC platform is an amazing platform, um, especially for those guys who go out there and build their rigs and make these amazing um, you know, rigs that play these games at ultra levels, and that's really dope. But I'm a console gamer, and I don't like the fact that my games, or, or shall I say Microsoft's exclusives, hit the platform. But the one thing I did, I really did love about Microsoft Conference was that they let you know exclusively on Xbox One before they announce a title. This game is exclusively on Xbox One, Halo 5. This game is exclusively on Xbox One, um, uh, Gears 4. This game is exclusively on Xbox One, Forza 6. Their heavy hitters are still on the box. So if you still want to play the game, you still got to get an Xbox One, especially the big boys. Now, what's interesting is that they did put some really cool titles that made sense to put on there on PC. You have um, Gears Ultimate Edition going to PC. You have CFDs going to PC. That's an MMO. That makes sense. You have... Um, some a lot of the indie titles also are PC and Xbox, um, and then um, what was the Killer Instinct one? and Killer Instinct. Killer Instinct has now gone to PC, and in my opinion, Killer Instinct is a great game and it's a great incentive to pick up the Xbox One. But you know, it's 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 a downloadable title. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's it's a downloadable title, so it's not like you know, and it's a seasoned title, like a season pass title. It's not like a Street Fighter Five or a Mortal Kombat where you have this major release and then they drop a few a few characters in there and then you're done. No. Every season you're getting new things built into the game. You're getting new characters, new environments, new fatalities. So that's kind of cool. And they're bringing that to PC. And those type of games, I don't mind. But the big boys, the ones that matter, the ones that really separate your console from everything else are staying on the Xbox platform, and I'm cool with that. But one of the things that's coming from PC to the Xbox is mods. And a lot of us have been wanting mods for a long time. And that's coming to Fallout. That is huge. You know, I you know, a lot of people felt like, oh, you know, you know, PlayStation has Call of Duty DLC first. And Call of Duty is one of the major, major titles out there that sells like hotcakes because it's just it's a dual bro game. It's easy to pick up, it's easy to play. You have um, you know, it's a twitch shooter. So it's kind of like who shoots first, one of those type of thing. If you're quick on the trigger, you usually get the usually you usually get the kill. Don't get me. I'm not saying that's how it is, Call of Duty guys. I'm just saying if you shoot first, you usually get the kill depending on what guns you have. Um, but obviously, they are bringing mods to Fallout 4, and it'll be it's you know exclusively first on the Xbox One. That's huge. That's huge. That is Microsoft getting into the PC space, like the guy said at the show, if you haven't seen the E3 show, please go watch it. Microsoft is doing something that he wanted them to do for a very, very, very long time. And that was bring mods to the Xbox One. Now, my question is, what if Fallout is the first game to do this, what other games could be doing mods? Could we get mods in Skyrim on backwards compatibility? Is that possible? That would be amazing if they allowed that to happen. Let mods on the Xbox One for Skyrim come to the 360 version, and then it's already backwards compatible. It comes to the th Xbox One, and you're able to play those mods that give Skyrim more longevity. And I think that would be really, really cool. So uh, it's a really interesting dynamic that Microsoft is stepping in, but you can see them really starting to embrace this one ecosystem. It doesn't matter if you're playing on PC or Xbox One, you're playing on Microsoft's uh, platform. What is your thoughts, D? Well, like we mentioned before, man, it, it's all in one, um, and that's that's the vision that Microsoft has, and um, you can see that if you listen to their new CEO. Uh, you know that was his vision from the start. Right. Is you know he wanted one ecosystem, and you know gaming was a big part of that. He's one of the CEOs who who said that you know he wasn't going to get rid of the gaming division um, for Microsoft. So I thought that was huge, and you know stepping into the to the mods. Um, you know, th that's big, you know, for, for console gamers like us who prefer the console, um, you know, we, we get some of those same benefits as, as PC gamers. And, you know, this is just a start. So if, if more games, you know, continue to offer mods and, and we get some of those same things on, on the Xbox, you know, that's a win-win for us. You know, we, we didn't have to invest into, you know, $2,000, $3,000 rig, uh, you know, to take advantage of, you know, some of those features. So... I'm all good with that. Yeah. 
I think that's I think that's huge. I think Microsoft is stepping in a, in a good space right now with the whole uh, PC Xbox thing. I'm starting to see some of the benefits of you know joining a union with PC in the Xbox platform. Listen, I I tell you right now, I get into arguments all day. I got friends on Twitter and and guys that are really cool that are console gamers as well. And again, you you always have the saying, what is you know if the game is going to come to PC, why should I buy an Xbox One? You should buy an Xbox One because you can't play Halo. You won't be able to play Halo 5. You might be able to play an iteration of Halo. You won't play Halo 5. You can't play Forza 6. You can't play Gears 4. You can't play ReCore. You can't play Scalebound. You can't play Quantum Break. You can't play Crackdown. You know, at least right now, for what I understand, you can't play those games. I just don't see how people can still gloss over the fact that the Xbox platform is still an attractive system. It's still an attractive console. And trust me, there's a lot of PC titles that are on competitors' consoles that were on PC and hitting the console at the same time. Um, but like I said, you know, they're going in a direction that Microsoft feels is best for them. And the reality of it is this is not about the consoles anymore. That's the future. You know, people want to talk about, you know, Sony has X amount of consoles. Sony can have a hundred million consoles out into the world, right? But if Microsoft dominates the PC space, and let's say by the end of the generation, they have 50 million consoles out there. Do you know how many PC gamers there are out there in the world? Like, do you really understand comprehend how many PC gamers are out there in the world? The consoles don't make money. The games make money. The consoles is just a way for you to play the games. But if there's another way for you to play the games, if there's another way for me to sell my product, no matter what you're playing on, that's what's most important. I get full, you know, proceeds back from selling Halo 5 at $60 a pop per person. If I sell a console, I get 20 bucks on a $500 console. You know, that's not a lot of money. That's not a lot of money at all. It's the reason why when you see these console sales, these guys are always in a negative because the consoles are a debt. The purpose of a console is to get the gamer to play the game so they can push the games out. It's the reason why companies get upset when their games don't sell or someone gives it a bad rating because that's where the money's at. The money is in the software, not the hardware. Um, so Microsoft, as the geniuses that they are, have decided to go ahead and look at Windows 10 and look at the Xbox One and decide that Windows 10, not Xbox One, not PC, Windows 10 is the platform. Windows 10 is the platform. Windows 10 is coming to Xbox One. Windows 10 OS is hitting PC. And Windows 10 is the platform. Windows. That is a new platform for the Xbox. And it's Windows on phone, Windows on tablet, Windows on Xbox, Windows on PC. And they're giving you the opportunity to stream, uh, cross-buy, cross-play, or purchase on, you know, or play on either system. No matter where you are, at least in the home right now, not, excuse me, not out in the world, but at least in the home. No matter where you are, you can play the game. Actually, yeah, no, even out in the world, I think if you have an internet connection and you're somewhere else, you can still play your games because it's cross-buy, so you can load it up on the Xbox app on PC. So if you buy for Xbox, you'll have it for PC. If you buy for PC, you'll have it for Xbox. That's genius. It's genius, you know. But there's certain games, obviously, that you can only play on the Xbox platform, which is the big titles like Halo and stuff like that. So, you know, I think they're going in the right direction. It's a real interesting dynamic. A lot of fans might not like it, but in the end, it's going to benefit Microsoft. It just means more money in their pockets, more games for us, a healthier division, and talk of them getting sold completely and utterly, once and for all, put to rest. So, I got to tell you guys a story. You know, myself, B-Money, Skittles, we're on our way to E3. Um, you know, our guy, our cameraman, he got sick. He couldn't make it. So we had to ride the train in LA. As we're getting, going down the escalator, we're getting ready on the train. You ever play Skyrim <laughs> and you have like this random NPC come up to you and they're like, my father is sick. Or, you know, my, my husband, he went into a cave to investigate something and he couldn't come out. Can you please help? Literally that happened to us. But when we discovered who the person was, we were like, okay, wow, that's amazing. So this woman runs up to us as we come off the escalator and she's like, 
hi, I'm, I'm trying to, are you guys going to E3? And we're like, yeah, we're on our way to E3 right now. She's like, oh my God, I'm trying to get to the convention center. I don't know where to go. Do you mind if I tag along? We're like, yeah, sure, no problem. Come, you know. So we get on the train and we're riding the train and we start this conversation. She's like, so who you guys are? And we tell her who we are and everything like that. And then we ask her, you know, who she is and where she's going. She's like, oh yeah, you know, I'm a, I'm a developer. I'm on my way to E3 to go check out the game. And we're like, oh, cool. We're like, so what game are you working on? She's like, Uncharted 4. <laughs> and we're like, the Uncharted 4 for PlayStation? She's like, yeah. I came up from um, San Diego. And I was like, we were like, holy, you know. So we just had this crazy conversation with this Sony developer, this Naughty Dog developer, who was riding the train to E3. And we had no idea we were helping her get to E3 to go check out the game. And it was just so dope as we talked about Xbox and everything like that. And she was all into it. And she was, you know, giving us her thoughts on Xbox and PlayStation and everything. And one of the things she said as we got ready to depart ways, which kind of like was like, oh, wow, kind of blew our minds, was that we were like, hey, you know, we saw we saw Uncharted 4 at the conference. And if you go back and you watch Uncharted 4, you can tell that Uncharted 4 still needs work for all what it looks like. It still had frame drops, screen tears, and things like that. And it crashed not only once at E3, but it crashed when they showed it um, earlier at the PlayStation Experience. So, you know, they have work to do. So we told her, hey, you know, the game looks great, but you guys got to work on it. And what she says to us is, yeah, we know if we don't, like, we, we are really rushing to get this thing out. Um, and if we don't get it done, it's, like, going to blow up in their faces or something like that. And we're sitting there like, oh my God, like the game, is it really that messed up? You know? Um, and we were kind of shocked that the game was really, really that messed up. So, you know, she, I, I think her title, she was the uh, director or something for cinematics. Um, I think she was the creative director for, creative director. She was, yeah, she was the creative director for cinematics for Uncharted 4. So I just was like, wow. That was crazy that she even said that to us and things like that. And it's just a really interesting dynamic to show you the, you know, look, I'm not trying to play Uncharted 4. I think Uncharted 4 is going to be an amazing game. I want to buy it. I want to pick it up. I played Uncharted 2. I thought it was great. I didn't get Uncharted 3. I skipped it. I was just playing Xbox from there on. But I think that Uncharted 4 is going to be amazing. I want to pick it up for PS4. When I get a PS4, it's going to be really cool. But it just, it's just like, the, I don't know what's going on with the quality of the content this generation. I just feel like everybody is trying to push graphics, graphics, graphics. We're losing the essence of the games. These consoles can't pump out graphics like that. And I think the sooner we realize that we're going to have good looking games, we're not going to have games that look like, you know, you know, some of, some crazy, crazy looking game we've never seen before. I just don't think it's going to happen this year. I'm sure the games will get better over time. I just don't think it'll happen this year. Because yeah. it seems like every time somebody try to push these consoles to the limit, the games fall apart. So, we'll see what happens. Uh, but that was that was interesting, B. What, what do you think? You thought that was a really cool, interesting thing that happened to us while we were out there? When, when she walked up to us, I, I thought she was just, you know, some random, you know, female that was heading over to, to E3, um, you know, we, we didn't know what her title was or didn't even know that she was a, some type of developer, but it was cool that she was, um, gave us a little insight on, you know, they're, they're in crunch time right now for Uncharted. Right. And, you know, it's understandable, you know, that's, that's their marquee game for PlayStation right. and it missed this holiday. Right. And, and it's unfortunate because there's, there are not many major titles for the PlayStation this holiday, but you know, it missed this holiday and, you know, they're rushing to try to get it out early 2016. Um, I, I think it's a big mistake for any of these uh, game developers to try to push graphics. Mm -hmm. Gameplay is the most important. Um, you know, the, the quality of the game, the the experience that you have with the game is the most important. You know, right. if the game is 1080p, you know, running at the highest resolution. So, um you know, and you can kind of see that, you know, from, from many developers, it's just not Naughty Dog or, you know, PlayStation PlayStation games. We've seen that with games that have been on, on all consoles. So, you know, hopefully, you know, this next upcoming year or, you know, the year after that, developers can kind of find that, you know, the game doesn't have to be the most beautiful game on the console. Right. And, 
it's you know it still can be a great game without being max graphics right you know, it doesn't have to look like a pc game right i mean if you look at you know games like ori in the blind forest and and things like that smaller titles look great you know what i mean there, there's no major complaints there of course we want the games to look great for triple a experiences but every game doesn't have to have to be this masterpiece to, to be a great game right i agree i agree um you know, obviously, they're going to do their best to get the game going. I hope that the guys at 343 make sure that Halo works properly when it comes out because that's their big title. Um, and I hope that the guys at the Coalition has, uh, you know, gears running as amazing as possible. And I hope everybody hits their benchmarks, you know, even even Sony. I hope everybody hits their benchmarks at 1080p, 60 frames per second. You know, it just makes those games and the quality of those titles uh, that much better. So that was E3, man. E3 was great. We had a blast out there. If you guys have seen the video, the tech experience, you kind of already saw some of the guys we chatted with. Like I said, we got some content coming, uh, a few interviews that we did uh, with some of the people on the showroom floor at um, E3. Those will probably be released this weekend. Now, I want to reflect on Gamescom before we get out of here. Obviously, Gamescom is a big show. It's coming up in August. I believe it's August 5th is the show. Microsoft is going to have an event there like they had at E3. And again, what they showed at E3 was for 2015. This is exactly what I said. This is exactly what Ken Lobb said. You know, they showed a, a sprinkle of titles coming out in 2016, but we know those games are coming. And remember, if you if you go back and you listen to the Phil Spencer interview, the man said, I got games locked up to 2017. He probably got games locked up to 2019 now because we had that interview in 2014. So it... it it's just crazy that they have these things locked up. And everybody's always complaining about the games that Microsoft don't have. You don't know what Microsoft had. We didn't see, we, we knew nothing about Recore. Nobody knew anything about Recore. Recore was a surprise. Recore was the biggest surprise at the show. And though it didn't get as much recognition or, or, or garnered that much attention, it was a huge surprise because nobody expected that game to show up we had no idea that the IP even existed. So you don't know what Microsoft has, but Phil does. And Phil is, is you know, primed to release a bevy of IPs this generation. And I'm glad the guy's in charge. So Gamescom is coming. You know, we spoke with Phil um, when we were, you know, at the on the last day. We were there at the show and things like that. And there were some things that obviously I couldn't post. Um, you know, there's a lot of privacy things, a lot of print things like that, um, that we had conversations about, but what's really cool is that we did speak about Gamescom and the, and the great thing about Gamescom is that, you know, it's going to be a big show, just like E3. We're going to see gameplay of Crackdown, Scalebound and Quantum Break. Um, and that's great because I need to see more of Quantum Break. Scalebound is my game for 2016. Love Gears. Looking forward to Gears. Gears is in my top three. You know, I look forward to Crackdown. Hopefully that game really picks up and it's an amazing title. I really want that franchise to become a big franchise again. You know, it wasn't a big franchise on 360, but I would like it to become a big franchise, a staple in the Xbox library. And Scalebound, to me, as a RPG guy, action-adventure guy, you know, a guy that loves to level up his characters, I think this is my type of game. And, and I'm looking forward to seeing what the game looks like. And if you, again, if you saw the Tick Experience, when I was talking about Horizon for the PlayStation and why I was impressed with it, look at Eric Greenberg's face when I'm talking about that game. Look at his face when I'm talking about the game. Watch how he turns and looks at Phil Spencer when I'm talking about the game. Look at his eyebrows. He's like, yeah, you, you think Horizon is great? Wait till you see Scalebound. And what does Phil say? Phil shakes his head. He's like, yeah, well, then you're going to love Scalebound. Scalebound is about to be the hottest I'm telling you right now, Scalebound is about to be on everybody's lips. The man Ken Lobb told us when he came on the show, it could be one of the greats of all time. You don't just say that for a reason. You just don't get that vibe for no reason. Listen, I understand that's their game. That's what they're supposed to do. But you don't hype a game like that if you don't feel that it's true. You just don't. And I think it's going to be a big, big title. Now, Aaron Greenberg also stressed to us that there'd be some new things at Gamescom as well. I asked him if it would be IP. I don't know. We didn't see anything from Twisted Pixel. 
I spoke to press play on the red carpet. They said they're going to be at E3, but they're going to be actually at Gamescom. So they have some new stuff to show. So that's another new IP that we'll be getting from press play. Uh, we'll probably get a new IP from Twisted Pixel, but that's not all. They have something else. I don't know what it is. It can be, it can be the something with the OS. It could be a new console. It could be a slim. I don't know. But the appeal is for the Europeans because that's where they're losing. And this is the reason why they're going to Gamescom and they held some of these games back. Because in America, they sell well. But if you appeal to the Europeans and you say, hey, check this out. We got this game. And we got this game. And we got this game. And it's all coming out in 2016. Like, just think about that lineup. You got, you got ReCore, Scalebound, Crackdown, Quantum Break, Gears of War 4. That's insane. That is an insane lineup. Oh, and did I not forget to mention Forza Horizon 3? Because that's an annual title. That's insane. That is just, that's bananas. There's so many titles coming out next year. You got the Idea Xbox program. Um, you show Ashen. We have Below. Um, I don't know if Cuphead is going to, I think Cuphead might release later in the year. But there's a ton of Idea Xbox games that look amazing. You know, I was, I, I really am happy that I've been able to play some of these indie titles because I've been really impressed, really, really impressed. And we are going to make a bigger effort to, to show some of these indie games um, on Tick Podcast and talk to some more of these developers to get the word out there about some of these games because a lot of people don't recognize these games. These games are really, really good, man. They look good. They play well. These games usually, they actually work better than some of the AAA games. And they're really more creative than the AAA games because these guys need the creativity to outshine some of the big titles. So, it's, it's, we look forward to talking to a lot of people. We have a big roller of decks of indies that we'll be having on the show. Um, and we are really stepping our game up. But again, B, your thoughts on next year's lineup and, and what they could show at Gamescom. Do you, do you think they'll have any big surprises, maybe another AAA game that they may show besides what they'll be showing this year? We got games. We got games, man. <laughs> Trying to tell y'all, man, that boy Phil. It's something serious, and we got games, man. 2015 is no joke. 2016 is looking much better, man. We got games everywhere. Uh, I got to shout out to Idea Xbox guys. Um, you know, we got a chance to check out a lot of their games. And like we said, we'll definitely be bringing those uh, developers on and, and trying to, you know, put put those games in front of as many people's faces as possible. Um, but as far as 2016, man, um, Recore is definitely one of my titles. Uh, definitely looking forward to Scalebound. Um, I definitely have to agree with you that that'll definitely be top of my list uh, for next year. Um, and, and Gamescom, Gamescom is going to be big, man. I think you know the ability to actually show off you know those three major titles: uh, Scalebound, Quantum Break, and uh, and uh, what's the other one? Crackdown. 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 Um, you know that's that's huge. Um, Twenty sixteen. Will- games and I, I think um you know one of the things that that greenberg said is that you know there'll be new experiences at at uh gamescom yeah. he didn't necessarily say that there'd be new ips but there'll yeah. be new experiences so um you know there there's a possibility that we'll get sequels to games or or something along that line um but i think gamescom is going to be huge i think uh phil definitely recognized that you know with gamescom being a consumer show and, you know, as many people that's going to be there, it's, it's best to put, you know, the best foot forward and, and show what they have and, and what the future looks like for, for Xbox. Um, I would definitely love to see, you know, a new IP, um, you know, another sneak attack like Record was. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I'm excited, man. It's it's only a few more weeks away. I mean, July is going to fly through and, and games come and be here in, in no time. So I'm excited to see what, see what they show off. You know what's crazy? I think about it. I think did they even show Fable at the Microsoft conference? No, that they, they didn't show it on. They didn't show on, it at uh, all, right? No. What if Lionhead shows up <laughs> at Gamescom and surprises us with the Eden Falls game? Yo, how crazy would that be? That that would be bananas, man. Now again, he said not new IPs, but new experiences. What if they actually still have Silent Hill? Yeah. How crazy would that be? That would be crazy. Now, obviously, that's just stuff we're throwing out there. But it's just the point. You know, we don't know what Twisted Pixel is doing. We don't know what Press Play is doing. They could be working on older games. 
and re-releasing them as, you know, maybe platformers. Maybe we may get a Conquer this year. Maybe we may get a Banjo this year. Who knows? Rare has so many titles. They're working on CFDs. They could just pass these games out to other first-party studios, kind of like Microsoft did with Killer Instinct, took it from Rare and gave it to Double Helix and then Iron Galaxy. Like, you just don't know. So, guys, tune in to Gamescom, man. We cannot forget that Microsoft also acquired a few companies within the past year. And we know Leap Experience Pioneers Mm -hmm. is working on something. Mm -hmm. So, um, and and we know HoloLens is out there, and we know that they're working on HoloLens. Yep. And and they kind of gave us a little a little taste of what HoloLens can do at the Microsoft conference. Yep. And if you're lucky enough to be at E3 and step into the Halo uh, booth, you got a chance to you know try on HoloLens and, and and see what that's all about. So, I wouldn't be surprised if Leap Experience Pioneers drop some hot at Gamescom to kind of show off, you know, what else HoloLens can do. Um, I think that would be a welcome surprise. And then, you know, that's a consumer show. So it is, yeah. you, you can let consumers get their hands on it and, and see what it's about. And, then, you know, that that takes you into 2016 where, where you're looking to maybe launch HoloLens. So. Yeah, I, I think I think that if that all happens and all that comes to fruition and we see some of those things, listen, man, I don't, I don't care what any other – developer or company is pumping out microsoft is on the right path they have no choice to be they have no choice to be they have to be as innovative and as creative as possible because they are i won't say they're on the brink of being you know left out because it is the the number two console right now on the market um as far as market share is concerned um but the reality of it is if you want to set up for your next console and I'm going to stress the fill. If you're going to have him on a Phil Tolbert, I'm going to stress the fill that, listen, your next Xbox needs to be a monster. Yes, it's got to be. Your next Xbox needs to be a monster. If you're going to be putting PC games, if you're going to be putting Xbox One games on PC, we need a console that competes with it. Because you can't sit up here and have us have this console. Yes, it could be affordable and stuff like that. But you can't have us with this console that's getting blown out by titles on a PC. It, it, it not only does it hurt us as consumers for the console brand, but it, it does really make it seem like, well, I just rather spend the money on a PC. So make sure that the next Xbox is a monster. That's worth 500 bucks. You could make that console 500 and throw Connect in and another, another uh, SKU for 600. I buy the 600 one. You know what I'm saying? People will buy that because it's a premium thing. But then you got the the big one. People will spend money if they know the product is top of the line. That's the thing. If you're showing top of the line stuff, then they say, hey, the money is worth the value. You know what I'm saying? But you've given us these these consoles, PlayStation and Microsoft have given us these consoles at over the value of what they are, in my opinion. Um, you know what I'm saying? Especially the extra hundred bucks with the Connect, because nobody's played the game with Connect. Really, that's been satisfying besides D4, maybe a, you know one other title. But I love the Connect for what it does functionality wise with the Xbox platform. So if I was them, I would focus on what the Connect does for the Xbox more than what it does for games, and just make the games in the center until somebody masters the Connect with the title um, that really shows off what it can do. Until then, keep Connect the focus on what it can do with the console and why it's important. For Cortana, why it's important for Twitch, why it's important for navigation, and why it's important for voice commands and you know automatic sign in and everything else that the Connect can do and things like that. That makes it worth um, what it is. So you know, again, E3 was amazing. Gamescom is around the corner, about a month away. You know, Take Podcast had a great experience. We got a new team, a new website. <laughs> like we are literally doing this for the fans. We love doing it, and, uh, you know, I, I've only been positive. We've been positive. We've gotten amazing feedback from everybody. We're on the way up, and we really appreciate all the support. Go out to TICGN.com. Sign up, man. I know some of you guys haven't been, been able to get on the forums. We're trying to fix the forums. It's an issue with the forums. It's for some apparent reason, every time we somebody gets on the forums, it gets reset. So we're trying to fix that. As soon as we get the forums working, we'll let you know. We need you guys in the forums talking, chatting, you know, let's get the forums buzzing because that's where we're going to be giving us a lot of giveaways in those forums areas. So definitely support us. Go to TICGN.com. You know, check out the website. Let us know what we can do better. Leave us comments. You can email 
uh, you can email us at TIC, no, excuse me, you can email us at admin, A-D-M-I-N, at TICGN.com. And I'll actually get those, and our other admin will get those personally. And let us know your thoughts about how we can improve the site. What are the things that you want to see on the site? What we can do better? Because, again, this is your site. This is for the fans. Give us as much feedback as possible so we can fix it and make it a better place for you guys um, to go. So you don't have to worry about going to places like, you know, I don't want to say any names. <laughs> but just know that just try to make it the best site possibly for Xbox fans, Windows fans, tablet fans, tech fans, anime fans, movie fans, TV fans. So definitely check it out. Let us know what you think. The podcast is on there as well. I'm your man. And your host, KORS Kalel, my boy, B Money 101. You got anything to say, B, before we get out of here? Nah, man. You know, we, we got the game. So everybody just get them Xboxes ready. It's about to be a crazy fall. You know what I mean? We got so many games coming, not just from Microsoft, but third party, you know, big, big titles big this titles. year. So, yeah. um, you know, get your Xboxes ready, man, because it's, it's on. Yeah. That's going to be so bananas this year. Xbox is probably going to sell and win the holiday season again. And did I just hear the Forza Xbox rev up when you turn it on? How bananas is that? How bananas yeah. is that? That is that's that's amazing. If you haven't heard it, go look it up. The the Forza Six Xbox bundle when you turn it on, it starts up like a car. It's fire. I'm your boy KRS Kalo, and I will holler at you guys next time. And we're off this planet. Peace. Peace. For the fans, by the fans. Mm-hmm.